Thank you, and good morning. And welcome to the Hell and High Water Creative Interlude. What you just heard and saw then was the prologue and Freedom Calls, the opening section of a musical theatre work that's currently under development. My name is Chris Hurden, and over the next hour, my friends and I will give you a behind the scenes look at the creation of a musical. I will be interviewing two of the creators of Helen Highwater, lyricist Kieran Davey and composer Matthew Samer. And they will tell you how it all began and take you through the different stages of the musical's development so far. Now Matt will also be our musical director today and will give you an insight into his creative process and show you how he gets the most effective storytelling out of the performers and the music. Especially for the Independent Schools Queensland Innovation Forum today, I invited the Southbank Institute of Technology Screen and Media Animation Program to contribute a visual element to this session. You will be seeing animations from uh, some students and I will be interviewing one of the teaching team about the students' work. We have been looking for ways in which to visualise Helen Highwater on stage and so by having these people coming along maybe uh, we'll be creating a few ideas of our own. Firstly, let's begin with a brief background history of the Batavia. The story of Helen Highwater is based on one of the darkest chapters in Australia's maritime history. In 1629, the Dutch East India Company ship, the Batavia, set off on its maiden voyage, and it followed the spice route to Java, which today we know as Jakarta. The Batavia struck a reef and sank off the uh, Western Australian coast. Of the 332 people on board, many drowned, and only 280 made it to land. But most of those would die during the murderous mutiny and bloody mayhem that followed. There's an image you're about to see, you may have just seen it, um, it was coming up shortly, uh, which shows the remains of an actual Batavia victim. Firstly, I'd like to start with Kieran. Come on up, please, Kieran. It all started with you. Um, tell us, why the Batavia? Um, well, the Batavia, it's a, it's a true story, and it's an incredibly interesting true story. Um, one of the earliest experiences of Europeans on the Australian coast. Um, uh, the, the project first started back in 2007 when um, Matt and I and uh, the other writer, Jacqueline Osorio, um, were part of the theatre company at University of Queensland, and Matt got asked to be in charge of the process, annual process musical for the company. And um, he already had a reputation for uh, being a good composer and musical director. Um, and he immediately came to me and said, um, give me 10 ideas um, of shows we could do, and I'll pick one. So I did, and um, the Batavia was in there. It was at that stage, like a couple of sentences, but um, Matt picked it out, and from there I drafted a story, um, or our interpretation of the real story, and went from there. A good log line can work wonders, can't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the children's literature book Strange Objects by Gary Crew. What's the connection between that and Helen Highwater? Sure. Um, Strange Objects was a book I believe I read in primary school. And um, at the time, it was an incredibly uh, gory, dark story, which I was very drawn to as a child. Um, and it always stuck in my mind. It was, it was a, a very different interpretation of the Batavia story. Um, but you know, always in the back of my head, I'm like, that's a really interesting story. And, I think with a lot of writers that happens, you'll, you'll come up with an idea, and you may not use it for years, but then up it pops, then you use it. Mm -hmm. And it, that's what happened with this story. Good. How did you research your story? Um, fortunately, um, the Batavia is one of those um, horrible maritime events that has a lot of information about it, um, particularly because the um, commander of the ship, a gentleman by the name of Commodore Palset was his name, he had a very detailed log about what happened, including what happened to all those on board, um, the fate of the mutineers, really detailed. And I mean, that was the first port of call and we pulled a lot of material from that. Mm -hmm. And um, 
your protagonist. From whose point of view is your story told? Um, we picked out a, a lady's maid by the name of Zwanti Hendrix. Um, she is the chief protagonist, but we, we often follow quite a few narrative voices. Um, there is about, um, there's about half a dozen sort of protagonists and one particular antagonist who was the leader of the mutineers, which Chris has a very intimate experience with. So far, yeah. You'll hear him singing that part later. Um, and we really, we just basically adopted the best voices to tell the stories. Um, for Zwanti, it's a story of a young girl effectively through these horrendous experiences becoming a woman. It's a coming of age story for her. Right. How much is factual and, and, and fiction? Uh, it's, it's a tricky line when you're, you're working with historical fiction, which is effectively what this is. Um, there's a lot of detail about the physical occurrences um, for the survivors of the Batavia, but obviously not a lot of emotional detail. So that's really where the sort of fictionalization came into it. You know, how do people respond to the events around them? That's great. Thanks, Kieran. Stay there. I want to drag Matt into this. Uh, Matt, what was your starting point and how you got interested? Um, well, like, like Kieran said, um, I was approached to, to write a process musical underground productions and I thought, well, I need to write something and Kieran's the best ideas man I know. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, he, he came up with this idea of the Batavia and as soon as I heard it, I was, I, I was very certain that that was the story I wanted to write. So, if you're going to invest a lot of time and emotional energy and creative energy into something, it has to be, I guess it has to be something that really captivates your imagination and that's what the story of the Batavia did for me straight away. Okay, and uh, the style of music that you've chosen, was that dictated by uh, Kieran's lyrics? Kieran and Jackie's <laughs> lyrics? <laughs> Not really, I mean, um, as a composer, I guess writing music is a very personal experience and I, I like to write music that's very kind of um, emotionally moving for myself. So being a classical pianist, um, I remember that my favorite music was always from the romantic period. So beautiful melodies, intricate harmonies, just music that really connected. And I guess, because Batavia was such an emotional story, I wanted to write music that would really captivate the, the audience emotionally. So I had a style, I guess, which I was going to write in, regardless of what Kieran did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that being said, he would come to me with, with ideas for songs, and he would say, you know, we need a song about sailing on a ship for the opening and he would give me themes and ideas and potential characters and that that we would write and then I would kind of just be inspired by that and somehow write a whole musical yeah. which I did so. very much a process of negotiation um we would work on we workshop the story and see what what songs were required to tell the story the way we wanted it told um and given that we would we would effectively almost give Matt like a, a mood board of what needed to happen here and then Matt would give us back a theme and we'd draft lyrics to and from all right that's, uh, that's great. Tell me a bit more about the uh, collaborative process. Was it lots of meetings or lots of emails? A lot of meetings, a lot of um, tears and laughter on the floor of my music room, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think we really preferred to work together because then it could it be an actual physical thing that we were working on um, at the time. And being inspired by it, you kind of have to be there. So. Okay. Now, um, um, Kieran, Matt's about to work on a musical piece called The Unforgiving Land. Can you tell me what's the role of the sirens in Hell and High Water? Uh, the only aspect of the Batavia story that we have completely made up is the sirens. Um, they're a mythological creature, so obviously they're not factual, but um, we wanted something that would definitely um, sort of emotionally framework <laughs> the story. They function almost like a narration, but more of an emotional narration rather than a, a physical um, telling of the story mm -hmm. and um, they really help sort of emotionally highlight moments in the story that really need that that boost. Fair enough. And what what were you aiming for with them uh, Matt uh, being such a beautiful haunting? Uh... Well when you think of the sirens um, immediately you think of images of the sea and I think we always played around with the idea that they would be part of a manifestation of the sea so you think about tides and ebbing and flowing so we have to have these melodies that are kind of emulate that and and, and definitely that haunting idea, but um, we also play around with them being the physical manifestation of the madness that occurs on the land as things become crazier and anarchy unfolds, they kind of become stronger. So they also have this malevolent kind of imagery attached to them as well. So. That's great. Um, would you please introduce The Unforgiving Lamb, what, it, what it's about and uh, what you'd, uh, how you'd like the ladies to approach it? Okay, so we're actually going to fast track the story to just before interval, um, so this is Unforgiving Land. So 
Zwanti, the maid that Kieran was talking about before, so played by Rhiannon here today. Um, pretty much anarchy is starting to unfold. Um, some horrible events are starting to occur. And Zwanti's lady, Lady Lucretia, she's been driven to this point where she just can't take being abused at the hands of these men anymore. So she, she goes down to the beach and we play with the idea of her being lured into the sea by the sirens, that she chooses to take her own life because she can't handle it anymore. So we come back to Zwanti, who's just starting to deal with the idea of her lady being taken and what it means. So that's what, that's what the idea and the context for the song is today. Um, I will um, show you some of the way that I would musically direct with this song initially. So we might start it and um, we'll see how well the ladies do. And if I'm happy, we won't have to restart. But if they need to be tweaked a bit, I might have to show you some things that I would do to get the best out of kind of their storytelling. So if you'd like to stand, ladies. Okay, let's stop. <laughs> so this is a very haunting experience for the sirens at this point. They're really reveling in the, the distress and the madness that's happening on the land. So they have to be excited about what's happening. So ladies, what I need from you is some more connection to that. Um, the best way we can do that is to play with getting louder and softer to kind of emulate that idea of the tides rising and falling, okay, and really accentuating those notes, okay, and just go for a really haunting feel, okay? So here we go, let's see if it works this time. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Matt. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Jane Harty, a teacher at the South Bank Institute of Technology Screen and Media Animation Program. Jane led a team of her students. Uh, she managed to grab some aside outside of their normal uh, curriculum activities. And in their own time, and uh, at very short notice, I may add, uh, they each developed an animation to reflect the theme for Hell and High Water, and as well as I mentioned earlier, to possibly throw a few ideas uh, to us in regards to the uh, future staging of the musical. So we're just going to run some of those animations now, and I'll have a quick chat with Jane here. 
Uh, um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, Jane, how did you get the students interested in the project? Well, an animator is always interested in a story. So um, presenting the ideas of this uh, um, incredible story to our students um, fires up that imagination, I think, a little with the imagery. So we sold it to them that way. As Chris said, they had to go off some other projects at short notice to put together a couple of um, very simple animations that you're seeing here on the screen. And um, I think that's the main thing. I think it was an exciting outside project too, outside of their usual uh, classroom activities. So it makes it a little bit more real, I think, for them. I believe a couple of students were getting up here today. Did they make it? Um, I'm not quite we sure. got them I'm here? Not yet? Not sure. Yeah, there was a perhaps couple. Not, perhaps yeah. not. Oh, well, um, that's fine. Um, how does this project, you know, working with a, a, a musical theatre work, uh, differ from the normal classwork? Oh, look, um, it's a, in the animation program at South Bank, it's a traditional animation program. So it's classic um, cartoon animation and, and the principles and all the theory behind um, character animation. This is always a nice thing to do because it's got a bit more of an artistic element to it, a bit more freedom, a bit more uh, creativity and a different kind of context. So it's outside of that um, particular way that you have to draw and think and um, come up with a character animation. So it's a, it's a chance to play around with some software that, that really makes the job quite easy to um, playing around with imagery. So. I um, had to play around with a bit of the editing myself, and uh, but I'd have nice no work. idea how to get something like this started. Like, uh, how, how do um, students approach this? What's the starting point for them? Well, it's always a, a collaboration with yourself and finding out, doing some research around the production and then looking at some key imagery, researching that imagery and selecting some of it and thinking of ways of just compositing it together. As you can see, um, you know, there's still imagery with a little bit of animation over the top and it's just really to create mood and atmosphere and that was the main thing because we don't want to detract from the actual performance itself. It's, it's a complementary thing. So um, a collaborative discussion, research and then just getting down and putting it all together in the computer. As a teacher, do you think this is something worthwhile for the students to be involved in? Absolutely and we really push for it in our program. We love the opportunity to collaborate um, with creatives like Chris outside of um, um, South Bank and we're always, every year, we look for a, a collaboration project for our students to get involved with to get that experience liaising with someone other than the teaching team and get a sense of um, what it's like to really work a project. Yeah, a funny thing happened the other night at uh, uh, the Edge run-through of this that Justin came up to me running up after, <laughs> oh, now I know what you want. And the, That's um, right. He yeah. uh, went off and uh, brought in those, uh, we, we tried to incorporate them in today's showing, I think they're around here somewhere, but the, the 3D animation of the waves. Yes, that's blew right. Blew us away, it's, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think that because it was such short notice with this, and, and I look, I just think it's brilliant what I've seen with the, the team here too, with the singing and the songs and the, the, the drama and the, the emotion in it. It's just, just beautiful. And it probably would enhance it even more if we can see, mm. um, the students can see um, some of that as well. Uh, because hearing the sound side is the other, the other thing with animation. There's a whole sound side to it, which suggests a whole lot of different feeling and energy as well. So right. Now, can you mm. quickly tell us about the program, the Scream and Animation program, and uh, what sort of skills the students will pick up from this? Right. Um, the South Bank Institute Screen and Media Animation program is a great program. It's an all-round um, two-year program, and an advanced diploma is the final qualification. It gives everyone a chance to learn 2D and 3D animation techniques, but not only that, project management and uh, liaising teamwork, a whole range of things that we hope our graduates can go out there and uh, be confident in working in a variety of contexts within that industry area because there's a lot of different roles that, that are part of that. So Thank you. Yeah. Um, look, I need you to hang around after this is all sure. over in case someone does throw an animation Absolutely. question because I'd be lost. Would you be able to do that Absolutely. for us? Would you thank Jane Hardy, please, everyone? Thank you. Thanks, Okay, now let's go back to this story, um, Helen Highwater. We're going to delve into a climatic turning point in the musical. In the following piece, Death, Death, the murderous Cornelise, his lust for power, 
leads to indiscriminate killings and torture. This is all true, by the way. Very, very dark period in Australia's um, maritime history. No one is safe, least of all the women and children. Uh, Kieran, I'd like to ask you a few more questions. Uh, the subject matter is quite horrific. Uh, the uprising is brutal. Uh, how did you approach this in your writing? Um, well, I mean, it was always going to be uh, something we had to deal with, the fact that it was an incredibly violent occurrence, um, because this is intended as a stage production, just having an, trying to stage all of these moments. It's, first of all, not as effective as it could be on stage, and it's also incredibly hard to watch, particularly when you are talking about violence against women and children. Mm. Um, so I think this is a classic example of um, us having to deal with a lot of um, violence in a very short space of time, and most of the violence is implied, it's discussed. Uh, Connolly's is very specific with what he wants done, so we don't necessarily have to show people being beheaded on stage. Yeah, it'd be terribly graphic. I mean, uh, the, and the, the violence didn't end with the, uh, the mutineers, did it? There was the, uh, um, uh, they, they got their own form of punishment, hands chopped off before they were hung yeah, and this um, sort of thing. Yeah, some <coughs> of the most violent things that happened was actually um, sort of retribution against the mutineers themselves when they did eventually face uh, capture and punishment. Um, um, they had very creative ways of killing people back then. I think keel hauling, I was reminded of the words, where they drag you underneath the bow of a ship when it's covered in barnacles. Mm. I think the worst one, I think, was when they, I can't remember what it's called, it's like breaking on the wheel, where they would break your limbs backwards and then, yeah, tie you out in the sun. So, um, Let's go a bit easy. They haven't had lunch yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we, those are the sort of things where um, it's a bit much to ask an actor to bend their arms backwards, so... All right, we're going to go into this piece. Firstly, how would you describe Cornelise and uh, what, what's happening in this scene? Um, Cornelise is a very strange character. Historically, he um, suffered from very uh, severe syphilis, which um, addles with your mind in the later stages. So he, he gradually becomes more and more unhinged as the story goes, and this is definitely the height of his power tripping and um, complete loss of self-control. Yeah. Well, I won't be applying any uh, method acting to the role of Cornelius. I think that's best. <laughs> okay. All right, this is Death, Death. Yeah. Just a bit more context for the song. We've got, um, we've got Glenn. I don't know if you can see him, but he, he'll be playing the predicate at the beginning of the song, who, who was the religious figure on the land. Um, so obviously he's taking a huge objection to the things that are happening. And then, like Kieran said, Chris will be playing Cornelise, and we've got, we've got everyone else will be playing survivors that are kind of dealing with this court system that Cornelise has developed, where he can try people for the most ridiculous things, and it goes, and no one really has a chance. They have to do whatever he says, and, and they're all quite terrified. So this is death, death. to ease your mind I will do no such thing He states that marriage is a sacred right to be upheld Well boys, the man has got a point I will admit this time God has rules And we should try to play along Fortune bestows me the captain's rights Marriage is but a simple task I now pronounce you all men and wives can do what you like to the bride. You claim you struck my man because he tried to touch your wife. Yet when we tell you that she is a common whore, you seem to be surprised. In short, you seem to lose your mind. You, sir, are a danger to yourself. And madness runs in a family. Death is a cure to insanity. And I must think of the greater good. Death, death, smell of blood, smell of fear, another dies. Next, next, line them up, knock them down. Guilty parties move along, keep the puppets on their toes, cut the strings, another goes. Next, next, I have a message I long to send to Faber Hayes with your help. Sleep is 
so hard to find and we must hear your baby cry It's hardly fair, my dear, that such a little chap should whine and rob us of our peace The least we all deserve, my dear What can be said of a mother's worth If she cannot control her child My punishment hasn't even spread Neither should be let to keep their head Smell of blood, smell of fear, not the nice next, next, line them up, knock them down, get a killer, that's the rule. See the puppets on their toes, cut the strings, another goes. Next, next, smell of blood, smell of fear, not the nice next, next, line them up, knock them down, get to parties, move along, keep the puppets on their toes, cut the strings, another goes. Next, 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 next. Thank you very much. All right. The development of a musical is a long, continually evolving process. Uh, some scenes and characters get dropped, others written in. In 2010, when I first became involved in this project, uh, Matt and Kieran, you assembled a cast for a concert-style sing-through with narration. And you did this to seek some industry feedback. Um, can you tell me, who did you invite and what type of industry professionals? Well, we'd, we'd got into this place in the musical where we'd, we'd been writing it for a few years and we'd implemented quite a few changes, but we weren't really sure how it worked as a staged piece of theatre. So we realised that we had to invite some people to give us that feedback. Obviously, we wanted it from people that had experience in the field, so we, we invited people that we had probably worked with before or we knew, so... Um, directors, dramaturgs, people that had had experience with musicals, people that had experience with writing musicals, that, that could give us that valuable feedback about what we needed to work on and where we needed to go with the piece. Yeah. You provided feedback forms and you got some feedback. Uh, what did you learn from that? What changes did you make? Um, the main thing that we took from the feedback forms was, I guess, the holes that were missing from our story. So the things that obviously me and Kieran and Jackie knew because we'd been writing the show for five years and it was quite obvious, but... Obviously, the audience is always going to miss out on a few things that we just took for granted. So those, those were the main things that we looked at. How, particularly, I think, in the second act, the resolution of the show, um, just, just tightening up the character arcs, journeys, and, and making sure that the story was very clear. Now, it's a fully sung musical. How, how did you come to that choice? I think that probably came about after we'd been involved in Les, Mis Les Miserables with... Um, Ignatian's Musical Society in 2009. I don't know how many people know that show. I mean, it's very <laughs> popular, but <laughs> it's actually a fully sung through musical, which means that there's no spoken text really. It, it's sung the whole way through, kind of like an opera. Um, and I think I just had an epiphany moment where I was like, yes, that's exactly how we need to present Helen High Water. I think because we rely so much on the emotional journey of the characters and for the audience, music's the best way to convey that. So as soon as I told Jackie and Kieran about that, they were, they were very excited about that concept as well. Now, this, this next song was not with the show originally. This came about after the feedback and the rewrite, yeah? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the song that we're going to do now is actually one of the characters in the show, Yoni, who will be played by Kelly here. She's Zwanti's sidekick. So, but the difference is that she's, she's quite experienced. She's lived life a lot, and she just enjoys it, and she, she kind of lives it to the fullest. Um, we realised in the, in the reading that we did and some of the feedback that we got was that her journey wasn't very complete, so we really needed to look at her resolution as a character, and this song came about for her. So um, the context of the song is death, death has just happened, so the men are going crazy on, on land, it, there's anarchy, and these characters turn to whoever they can, you know, to kind of comfort themselves. So we have Kelly at the back here, um, she's going to sing a little bit of Judith, who's the predicant, the religious figure's daughter. And obviously, her and her family, they turn to prayer to comfort themselves. And a lot of other survivors do whatever they can, maybe to their loved ones and family. And Yoni's journey is that she realises that she actually has no one. She's lived this kind of crazy life. She, she doesn't believe in anything. She's got no loved ones. The only man that ever showed any interest in her, well, she turned him away. So this is kind of her journey when she realises that she doesn't have anything in exploring that concept. So this was actually the last song that we wrote to finish the work, and it was, 
it was such a success for us because we finally felt like we'd completed everything. So. I was thinking before or after the run, would you be able to show us how you break um, the, the, the chorus into different groups yeah, to, I'll show that. To, to wank yeah. the parts? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll leave it over to you, Matt. Okay, um, you can just stay sitting for this. This is a little insight into how I'd musically direct a, a song like this. So obviously, I've written harmonies and different parts for singers. So um, what I would do first is just teach them a line. So if we just take the first hearer, so sopranos, your part goes... Good, and altos go, hear us. Good, tenors. Hear us. Good, and bass. Hear us. Hear us. Good, so let's just put the women together. Ready? And. Good, and the men. So altos, can you just hold that F sharp really strong? Okay, ready? And. Yeah, hear that nice interval there when it works. Okay, let's put it all together. And... Good, and then I might look at the way that that sounds, if it's balanced, so I might ask the tennis to be really loud. Let's go. As you can see, it's not balanced anymore, is it? So, in fact, don't take that direction. It was bad advice from me, okay? <laughs> um, we, we'll also look at the um, expression side of things. So, at this point of the show, it's quite intimate and personal, so can we have it quite... Introverted. Good. Okay. So that's a little insight into what I would do. And then we'd put it all together. So let's get everyone up and we'll perform this song for you.
Well, this uh, opportunity to um, present this uh, during the Independent Schools Innovation Forum has been another interesting phase and uh, we're extremely uh, grateful for this opportunity, but it's been an, an interesting phase in the development of the Helen High Water. Um, Matt, what's the, uh, what's the future plans for Helen High Water? Where would you like to see this work? Well, obviously Broadway is the goal, so. <laughs> So if anyone's keen to help us get there, <laughs> in all honesty, um, me and Kieran are still working on rewrites since the last um, reading that we did. So we'd, we'd, we've done a lot of concert style versions like this where the cast sit and, and sing with music and get up and we do it as a concert style. So we really need to see it as a piece of theatre. So we'd like to find a director that will help us stage it. So we think about set and characters and costume and really do it as a proper work. So. That's probably the next idea, because we need to see if it works as a piece of dramatic theatre. We know it works as a concert, but does it work as a show? So that's the idea. Well done. Um, Matt, I was wondering, uh, would you be able to quickly rattle off the names of our ensemble, this great collective uh, of musical theatre performers who are all doing so well in Brisbane at the moment? Sure, I'm very lucky um, to be able to draw on such a rich resource of singers that I've worked with um, in the past. So I consider them to be very talented at what they do and definitely my friends as well. So this is Alicia, Rhiannon, Kelly, James, Ian, Chris, Kieran, Tom, Glenn, Joe, Beck, Kelly, Helen and Sarah. And they make up my wonderful cast, so thanks guys. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to finish off with a very short piece. It's a suitable <coughs> finale. Um, uh, and after that, we're going to be open to questions from the forum. Um, I invited Jane to stay back if you have any questions about the animation. You might want to talk to uh, ask something of uh, Kieran or Matt or of the cast. Um, I think I've done enough for the day, so, you know, don't have to ask me anything if you don't like. Um, this is when tomorrow comes. Now, Matt, you had to toy around with this because you had to work out an ending to suit what was happening here at the Forum because in your show, it just continues on. So tell us what, uh, how are you going to approach that and we'll quickly run it. Yeah, I wanted a really dramatic ending to kind of put a, an end on, on, on the conference today and the one that I had for the show isn't really appropriate. So I threw something together at the last minute. About half the cast have never done it before, so we should probably do a, a little test run, okay? So at the end, guys, um, for now, we have one. We'll go into the final three chords of Freedom Call. So let's just see how it works, okay? <laughs> Bear with us for a second, okay? So let's just go... Um, the future is uncertain. You can just sit for this, ready? One, two, three. The Okay, it works. Okay, so we'll do the piece properly for you now, okay? Um, just some context. So this is the very end of the show. So the, the captain has come back, the mutineers have been um, apprehended, everyone is kind of safe, and the idea is that they're, they're leaving this land, but they've been so affected by what's happened to them, it's a bittersweet victory. They're, they're free, but they've been affected by what's happened. And last time they were on a ship, they ended up in this situation, so there's that uncertainty as well. So this is our final When Tomorrow Comes.
Thanks. We're going to wrap up now, ladies and gentlemen. Would you like an encore? Thank you everyone, thank you. Thank you, Jane, and the Screen and Animation Programme.